So, at the moment, how in the sort of uh, theatrical elements in terms of costume and set and sound, what's your thinking at the moment? Well, um, the set is going to be very simple because it's sort of one location that then sort of morphs into this 1958 context. So we're looking at very much the set sort of representing that urban landscape, but that urban landscape that we all live in today is littered with the architecture and the signage from the 1950s and the 1960s. So the designer is looking at, um, you know, looking at those places around Stratford, around Croydon, which aren't modern, which are sort of little uh, sort of visual drops around those areas where, where uh, in Croydon where the riot, some riots took place, but you know, in areas where, um, whether it be in or at Stratford, um, where those sort of still most markers of history, like so road signage, you know, um, old sort of tower blocks that might be sort of being about to be demolished, you know, th those kind of things. And those will have markers on the set. But other than that, it's a very, very, that's very simple. It's really just to frame this one location, which is behind a lockup. Um, in terms of the costume, um, we will be looking very much at that again. The clothes look very much of their different times, and I think it will be there'll be a great theatre when you see two teddy boys walking on stage, um, you know, talking to a girl that's looking like you know anybody walking along the street today, um, and you know, with, with the with the drapes. Those the teddy boy costume is a very very distinctive costume, you know, based on a Edwardian dress, and in at the time 1958. You saw Teddy Boy walking down the street. You crossed that street. You know it was very much. They were very, very anarchist, maverick sort of gangs. In terms of music, I think this is this play with the sort of the the mixing and swapping between those two times. There's a great there's a great opportunity to make a great mix from the music of 1958 when teenagers were invented, which is another reason why Roy chose 1958. The music. You know, Elvis was on the scene, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, the reggae of the Windrush generation. Um, that's so rich, you know, but Skiffle, um, it's so rich that we're going kind to of really sort of be referencing and sort of drawing on that. Also, what I'm looking for, I've got a movement director coming into the process and I'll be very much looking at how we sort of, the actors sort of drive the sort of the, t the time travel how we pull and push the characters between, especially Sam, between 2011 or that place of theatre that he lives in with Candice and 1958 and how she drives it. She sort of pushes those characters in and out of their time. So um, that'll be quite exciting. Do you want to talk a little bit about the dialogue and the contrast and the, and yeah. the richness? Because obviously Roy Williams is a great playwright above all else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, well, he's... Very, very consciously, the brothers in 1958 talk in their Cockney slang, you know, he's put a bit of that Cockney rhyming slang in there. You know, it's, like, it's slightly cliche, but I think he's just really trying to pull out or exaggerate the, the sort of the identity of those two boys um, at that time. And, uh, and then when you have those conversations between Sam and Candice, and she's talking that very modern street urban slang, and he's sort of responding with his Cockney slang, and they're sort of they're mimicking each other and fighting off each other and going at lot heads at each other, going, you know, you don't say that, yeah, well, you don't say it like that, you know. Um, and when they kind of copy each other, how they're kind of really highlighting that, again, each generation will have their slang. That is the similarity, but it looks different, it sounds different. Do you want to just then talk about the rehearsal process? Because you're now talking about yeah. there's a whole musicality linking the theatre to the music and mm. beats and rhythms. So are you influenced by practitioners or are you just... Talk about the um, how you're going to work your actors in the rehearsal process. Well, I think the first thing to do is uh, um, will be... I think you talk a lot, there's a lot of the story is hidden, it's off stage, and I think it would be really about... We need to bring that story onto the stage and it's got to be held within the actors from the very beginning of the story. So. I would imagine in that first week of rehearsals, I'll be looking at those the secrets that those characters hold, what is being hidden, how it has affected their sort of physical state when they're on stage, because I think that will then inform 
how we then sort of bring that into the movement and into the sound. Um, I think the, 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 in the four weeks that we have, that will be the first sort of week um, that, as well as put, putting scenes on, seeing how that plays, um, I think we, from the second week we'll be looking very much at the physical language of that and making sure that we have the two arcs of the story, um, so the 1958 arc, and making sure that that's pitched perfectly so it has it, absolutely the impact it needs to have then on Candice's story as we come back to it. And that sort of push and pull and, and pitching between the two arcs will be the, one of the big challenges that for the second two weeks we'll just be making sure that we find the structure is absolutely linking in. We've got a very, very intelligent, savvy actress playing Candice um, who is, you know, willing to sort of dig right down into this. You know, this is a, a part of a lifetime really, for, for a young female actor. So very difficult for her. And it's is very, it? very difficult, because dramatic. she's got to play that vulnerability of that traumatised young woman, but she's got to play the front. Well, let's talk about the ending a little bit, whether, we've, whether you find this a hopeful play, a pessimistic play, or it just is as it is. The ending is obviously hugely powerful, um, incredibly strong. Mm. There will be girls and boys sitting in the same audience under the same pressures of Candice. So it's it's volatile, yeah. it's dangerous, it's going to be incredibly uncomfortable in, in some of the settings you're going to take it to. Mm. Uh, what did you want to talk about that? What we show in the play is that the girl doesn't sort of stay. At the, at the end of the play, the girl doesn't stay in her trauma. She doesn't sort of, you know, we don't leave her there going, this terrible thing has happened to you and now you're going to have to live with it for the rest of your life. You know, we do, you know, the character moves out of trauma at the end of the play. She has to move out in the physical sense as well, but she does move out of trauma. So I suppose if there are young people that are having to hide those, uh, those fears, that by seeing the character make choices, and they, we're not saying everybody's got to sort of make the same choice as Candice, but by making choices to determine change, you can move beyond it. You know, it doesn't have to be your entire life. And I think the character of Sam also shows that you may, you may, you'll be in a moment of terrible you know, decision and choice, but actually you move into something else. And I hope that's what we can sort of really pull out of, um, at, the, at the ending.